So data stories are key for driving impact in uh, organizations because data by itself is dry, incomprehensible, um, and difficult to understand. Animation is an extremely powerful technique for, uh, being, for using to uh, cr uh, create data stories. And so today I'm going to talk about how to combine the two together. I'm Jock McKinley. I'm Tableau's technical fellow, Tableau's first technical fellow. Uh, basically, I, I am part of the development team. Uh, after this talk, if you want to come up and give me some feature requests, that's my day job. Um, and uh, I would love to, I'd love to hear uh, a lot about uh, what, what you're trying to do uh, with data. Uh, and uh, my goal today is uh, to have you take away uh, some understanding from the academic literature uh, and from experts uh, about both uh, telling stories with data and also about animation so that you can use animation effectively in your stories uh, to drive impact in your organization. This talk, by the way, uh, is for everyone, uh, although at times I, got, I, I will get a, a little, little academic. So, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to start here with Hans Rosling. Hans Rosling uh, was a Swedish-trained doctor who went off uh, to Africa to do good in the world uh, with his medical skills. And when he and his wife got to Africa, discovered that uh, Africa and the world was different than uh, he had learned about it in his, in his Swedish education. And that, uh, that uh, experience drove him to start telling stories about the world. He gathered up a bunch of UN statistics uh, and told some really fabulous stories. This picture here is from Hans at a um, London Tableau uh, customer conference in London uh, that I got to attend. Um, and he, as you can see, he's, you know, one, you know, the, he, he was very Socratic, so one of the questions he's asking here is, where do a, a, a 7 billion people live? And then he get the audience involved with that. Um, and so he uh, found that data stories were uh, very, very uh, uh, impactful in terms of actually driving change in the world. Uh, but he also found, and he wrote this book, Factfulness, about how data storytelling is hard. Um, so shortly before he died, uh, he uh, stopped going around telling stories and with his son and his daughter-in-law uh, wrote this book. Um, and it, the book in, has two parts to it. One part is the, the basic story he tells about the world. You can learn that from the book. But the book also talks about um, why data storytelling is hard. And, so, and this is a, a public source slide from Hans Rosling um, about, uh, uh, about what he learned over his long career. Humans have 10 dramatic instincts that make it, uh, essentially the impact of data less effective. Uh, in particular, in the upper left-hand corner on the slide, uh, you can see there's a gap. That's, a, that's an example of dramatic instinct. We tend to go to one end or the other, or, or, or to the ends, uh, that, and that causes um, uh, less impact from data. Um, Hans actually ended up um, uh, naming his organization Gapminder uh, because he wanted people to mine the, mine the middle of the gap. But I'm going to focus on this one down here on the bottom that Hans labeled single. Uh, if you read the book, uh, a, a more academic name for this one is confirmation bias. Uh, this, is a, this is a bias that humans just have, uh, where if we think we know the answer to something, we will gather up evidence to what we, what we think it, uh, might be the answer to it. And um, 
The interesting thing about confirmation bias is that the smarter you are, the more effective you are at confirming your answer, right? So this is, this is, this is the one that really gets smart people, like, like, like data people, like, uh, people, like the people at this conference. And, 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 that's, and that's why I'm focusing on this one. Now, Hans's next slide is a visual depiction of, how, uh, of the factfulness commandments that you can learn by reading his book. Um, and so, like, for example, in the upper left-hand corner, he says, locate the majority. And then for the confirmation bias one, it is use evidence to explore multiple different possibilities uh, and then you can protect yourself from, from your, from your cog cognitive bias. And, um, and so uh, I recommend the book. Um, it, um, an even weightier recommendation was, uh, is, is Bill Gates. He felt the book was so valuable, he gave it to every uh, uh, college student um, in, in the country. Um, my wife and I, who's in the audience, read this book, and we decided to give it to our families. Uh, which, we have, which we have done. Uh, uh, we couldn't afford to give it to every college student in the country. <laughs> um, so no, let, me, let me focus on Hans in particular as, uh, um, as one source of expertise around uh, uh, using animation effectively for data stories. And for that, I'm going to go um, to his 2006 TED Talk. This was a significant talk by at TED at the time, and I'm going to play for you, hopefully, if um, the Internet's uh, uh, gods are, are, are friendly to me, a 45-second uh, 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 snippet from this TED Talk. I, I, I can't download it, so I'm just going to go straight to the TED site uh, and, and, and do that. So... Hopefully we can get the audio going here. And so if I click there. We want to see the change. Um, we didn't, oh, here we go. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go, can you see there? It's China, they're moving against better health, they're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, <laughs> they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they're still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. So how many of you have seen, seen, seen this? Yeah, uh, this, he, this is uh, uh, absolutely um, re relevant, even from 2006, even still relevant today. Um, and uh, uh, you can go watch Hans, um, um, whoops, let's see. Am I on am I slides? Yes. Um, uh, so Hans taught a lot uh, since he was essentially doing uh, uh, telling stories with data. He, he you can learn a lot from Hans, and so uh, I'm going to uh, pull out one 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 important thing about it, um, which is that uh, and it, and it's a particular example from before 2006. Um, so I'm going to show uh, this is this is from a standalone. Um, uh, uh, version of the story that he was telling to people. Uh, it's, just, it's his standard view, uh, and it's at a particular moment in the story. Uh, so across the horizontal, you have uh, GDP, and then you have child survival on the vertic vertic uh, vertical axis. And at this moment in his story, what he was trying to do was he was moving from regions uh, down to the country level uh, in the, in the uh, UN statistics data. 
So this is an animated GIF uh, of, of the little app that I have running. And as you can see, there's Sub-Saharan Africa breaking apart, and then he's showing the, 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 top, the top and bottom values of that. That, um, technically, so we, at, at Tableau, we call that a level of detail change, where you're going from region down, down, down to country level. And it is a really amazing use of a animation for that. Um, that, uh, that really, like, it simply and clearly explains the level of detail change. Um, and so the, the, the key insight that you get from this particular example is that um, data stories include logical steps. In other words, there's a, set, uh, there's a setup phase in a data story, a sequence of logical steps that, that typically leads to a, to a finding. And um, uh, a typical uh, logical step uh, uh, could be uh, a level of detail change, a, ch a changing, changing of, of adding a country filter in. And animation is really effective for uh, explaining those logical steps. Uh, at, the, at a minimum, it can just wake up the audience, right? But it can also make um, that a step a visceral uh, uh, for for the audience, uh, it, uh, if you it, oh, by the way, how many were at um, uh, uh, Polly and I, and Phil's talk earlier today? Okay, not that many. So uh, they uh, they they in particular talked about um, uh, the use of animation to show what uh, what what's changing and what's staying the same as you go through uh, various logical steps. And then, in fact, animation can also be used to illustrate um, uh, the logic of a step. Um, but as I'll tell you more than once in this talk, uh, you still need words to explain, explain logic. Animation is not sufficient uh, by itself. So I'm now going to show you, um, using the, uh, the uh, alpha that we have out on, on website, you can all go play with animation uh, uh, right now if you go to the pre-release pre site and find the animation alpha. I'm going to show you some um, uh, data stories that I've authored. But before I do, I, I want to say that I'm not a very skilled uh, 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 storyteller with data. Um, and you'll see this in, in the, co the quality of my views. Um, if you were at, at Iron Viz last night, you know that uh, skilled people can produce really amazing stuff in a short amount of time. Well, you have to have talent to do that, and I'm not really, uh, really talented that way. But the reason I'm showing you these stories is to illustrate um, how, how you can use animation effectively uh, in, in data stories. So let me switch over to Tableau and so I'm going to show I'm going to show you three stories and then one more example. And the the first story is a story about about migration. So um, this 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 story is about bird strikes and migration. And this still image here is from when Captain Solly su successfully he hit a flock of birds, uh, took, took out um, the engines on his US Airways plane. He was able to land on the Hudson. All lives were saved. So that's what I mean by a bird strike. And then, of course, the birds up in the air, that's what I mean, mean, mean by migration. They're, they're, they're heading either north or south. It turns out that there's a, that the uh, U.S. government U.S. government has a uh, wildlife strike mitigation working group, and this is the typical data. This is the data I'll be demoing in this particular story. There's uh, date fields, uh, 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 information about airports and species, and quantitative fields of one type or another. So this is um, a trend line. And it shows you that that particular data set has data over two decades. And this is the number of, uh, number of reports from pilots about bird strikes aggregated up at the year level. This dip here is that the final year of reports is incomplete. Now, that's the data aggregated up to the year level. And I have this little parameter control here. And when I click on it, 
I'm going to uh, show you what the data looks like aggregated up to the month level. So you're instantly seeing migration at this point. There's an up, up and down motion throughout a year of, uh, of reports from pilots about bird strikes. Now, that's, that particular trend line is pretty, pretty confusing. Let me reorganize it um, to put all the Januaries together. And so, yeah, you can see there's more reports from pilots in the summertime than in the wintertime. And then you can also see that there, there seems to be something interesting going on here in May and June. So let me combine all, all of the data together. And yes, if you, if you combine all the years together, there is this dip here between May and June. That's super interesting. Uh, so during analysis, I went exploring that particular th thing. So let's focus on that. Um, that's where you get to migration in, in, in detail. No, so it turns out that uh, birds migrate at altitude, which is not surprising. So I'm going to take all the reports from pilots, and I'm going to pull out all of the reports that are above 1,000 feet. So uh, let, me, let me do that. And, and um, so you, here in orange, what you have is all of the reports above 1,000 feet. And actually, you can see there that there are actually two uh, bumps. There's the bump uh, in, in the spring and the bump in the fall. And so this is a clear visual representation of birds migrating. And the gray line here is uh, we didn't get, uh, the pilot didn't tell us the altitude of their strike. And as you can see, it's a, a combination probably of, of, of ground and also uh, migrating birds uh, as well. So um, in this particular story, I wanted to focus on, um, on, on, the, on, the, on the migrating birds. And so what I've done here, well, first of all, this is, this is me. I just this, think of this as a very badly rendered Mount Rainier. I come from Seattle. Um, and, what, and what you have here is the data binned by uh, 1,000 feet elevation. So this is 14,000 feet here. And this is the number of, uh, so most of the reports are about strikes at, at, the, at the ground level. And then there is each 1,000 feet. This is a histogram of, of the number of reports. Um, but this is why you should care about migrating, uh, migration with respect to bird strikes. If I switch from the number of strikes to the cost, you can see that the um, average cost at altitude is much more significant than the average cost down at the ground. Um, and so uh, that, that is a reason why uh, migration is important with respect to bird strikes. Um, and so I've now introduced uh, multiple measures into this story. Uh, we can actually look at the, how they relate to each other. So here's, here's the uh, data sorted by elevation. Oh, by the way, bars are really good for looking at, at, at sorting and at ranking. Here's average cost and here's number. So I can switch the sort to average cost and we can see um, that the relation, that it doesn't really correlate very well with elevation, but if I switch to number, the sort to number, we can see it's inversely correlated, um, and, and, and so you can get a better, you can, you can use animation to get a better sense of what that data is about, which can be important in a, in a story. So that's an abbreviated version of that story about migration, and just to bring it to the end, this, the, the, the two red reference lines here represent uh, the miracle on the Hudson. That, as you can see, was a strike, um, an outlier uh, strike at altitude, as well as extremely expensive uh, strike as well. So my second story is um, also on the same data, just to keep that part simple. This is a, a standard meme that you'll find in in any kind, in all sorts of stories on the on the internet. Uh, this is a set of examples that you can, uh, uh, that a person by themselves can click through. These examples are, uh, what I did is I pulled out the eight most expensive strikes out of, out of, out of the data set, and then I um, ranked uh, the species um, by, by their cost. And so with those eight most expensive uh, um, strikes out there, this one is, uh, this is a single strike 
of a lappet-faced vulture, uh, not a, you know a specialized vulture uh, that's ranked at number one. But if I click on number uh, number eight, um, that will bring that will bring the wapiti elk. I don't know how to actually pronounce it, but I think it's something like that. It brings that up. Uh, to rank number two, and you can you, you, the animation shows the movement of that. Um, and oh, by the, I will publish this uh, when we finally have um, uh, animation running on Tableau Public. What's really fun here is to read the the remarks from the pilot uh, about the, the, this particular strike. This particular one, they they hit the elk on landing. Uh, elk, uh, elk bits were ingested into the engines of the plane. There were flames down the runway. Uh, the, the passengers on board the, uh, the, uh, of the, of the uh, Learjet survived and were, and were safe. So, so the, 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 the descriptions here are fascinating. Uh, and in fact, the whole data set's full of really interesting descriptions. So then I have a third example because I want to illustrate a couple more things about, uh, about lo uh, logical steps. This is you should invest in lighted runways. And so here's a tree map of all of the reports. And um, the size of the, of the square is the number of reports. And the color is the, the cost. And you can see up here at the top that unknown bird medium is, has the most reports. And, and, and the dark green indicates um, uh, 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 it's fairly expensive. But for lighted runways, I'm not interested in uh, the unknown species. So let's remove them uh, fr from, from this particular story. And so clicking on the parameter removes all the unknown ones. And now we can see that morning dove is at the top. Um, and then you can see uh, that Canada goose, in terms of cost, it's dark green, is, um, is uh, uh, significant. Um, and so let's reorganize the tree map um, by cost on size. And so now Canada mo uh, goose moves up to the top. And now we see that number two in terms of reports, or in terms of cost, is the uh, white-tailed deer. And this is where we get to lighted runways um, because, um, you know, it's not just birds in this data set, but also uh, ground animals. And so what I did is I binned um, all of the reports uh, by ground or not ground. So down here you can see there aren't, there aren't by, by raw counts, there aren't that many uh, uh, ground, ground species, but they, do, they are in the data set, and then most of them are non-ground non species. Now, for lighted runways, the interesting thing to do is introduce time of day. So that, that's adding time of day. And you can see the, the number of reports didn't change, uh, but, uh, but, but I'm now showing the time, time of day. And then to really get a sense of why lighted runways are important, if I change the percent of total, then you can see that the dark um, blue here represents nighttime. And for ground species, the nighttime is the significant time with respect to wildlife strikes. If the pilot can see that there's something on the runway, they're less likely, likely to hit them. And as I said, I had one more example that I wanted to demo. And that's because you can actually also use uh, animation t uh, in um, a little interactive applications, like a dashboard, uh, where you might go through a sequence of steps uh, or it's, the author might have published this dashboard for some task. And the task I had in mind here was um, drilling down in, in, into this, the same data uh, to understand uh, about operators or, or airlines operators at airports and, uh, and uh, uh, with respect to wildlife strikes. So there's, um, there's uh, standard actions here. So if I click on Portland, I mean on... Um, Oregon, then the bar chart updates step number two, uh, and and as you can see, Portland uh, got to the top, and then if I click on Portland, the scatter plot up, updates, and so these are all the um, uh, uh, specific operators in in uh, in the that had strikes from the Portland airport, and so for example, uh, I fly Alaska Airlines a lot, and and as you can see. It's both high in, in terms of number of strikes 
and, and, and total cost. So uh, those are my illustrations of, of data stories. Now, I want to start with a note of caution. And it, the, the note is illustrated, I hope, by this slide. You, you can instantly see a lion rustling in the grass because your remote ancestors did, probably, or something similar, and otherwise you wouldn't be here. Let, let, let me stop the animation. It's actually really hard to hear when animation is running. It's like your core in your visual system is, is uh, to, pay, to pay attention to animation. Animation is ex extremely powerful. And so the, no the note of caution is, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me talk about it a little bit about uh, the physiology behind it. So on the left here, you can see uh, a side slice of your eyeball and on the right side is a graph. It, the relationship is like this. The, back, the retina of your eye, eyeball, the back of your eyeball, is mi mapped to the horizontal axis of, the, of this graph. And then the, the density of rods and cones is on the vertical axis. So in the, in the fovea of your eye it are a bunch of cones that are focused on uh, high perception acuity and color perception. That's where you see, see, see color. Um, but, the, but the vast part of the back of the retina of your eye is uh, rods that are, um, don't do color, but they're really sensitive to animation. Uh, and, that, and that's because dangers in the environment can, can occur anywhere in your visual field. And so, uh, so your eyeball evolved to be able to notice uh, 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 any sort, sorts of changes at all. So that's why animation is so powerful. And so the basic caution is when you're in doubt as a, as, as a person using animation or telling stories with animation, uh, when you're in doubt, uh, be careful. It's, it's powerful and you probably shouldn't, you shouldn't probably animate. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the lesson from Hans Rosling about logical steps. Uh, in, you know, because animation can be used for many things, but uh, at this conference, the, the logical steps are, are, are what, are go what is going to drive impact in your organization. And so I'm going to step through uh, 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 various things. But before I do that, I want to talk about object constancy. So this is three still images out of, out of, uh, out of one of the stories I to told where I was reorganizing um, uh, temporal data uh, to put all the Januaries at the, at the beginning. Uh, the, the powerful thing about animation there was I was doing a spatial reorganization of the data, but you, could, you as the audience could clearly understand that I wasn't removing or adding any data at all. I was just doing a spatial reorganization. The phrase object constancy comes out of the human perception liter literature, um, but the, the, the effect is really, really great. You could understand uh, basically that uh, that, that, that I wasn't doing any fancy tricks with respect, respect to the data uh, while I was taking you through that step in the story. The next thing I want to talk about is filtering. Hans, so filtering is an extremely common step in, in data stories, and the, the Hans Rosling uh, um, example is an example of a slicing filter. Uh, by that, what I mean is, is that he had a, a graphical view and, and he, was, uh, had a, uh, he was filtering by year, slicing across that graphical view. Um, and in particular, you know, stepping uh, forward through uh, a, 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 a se sequence of years uh, gen generating his animation. Um, it's extremely effective um, to, to um, uh, use animation when, when there's time, time involved. But, you, but filtering also comes up in a lot of other cases as well. So uh, if you'll remember in this um, tree map view here, I, I filtered out all of the unknown uh, bird species. Um, and so the animation there clearly tells you what's exiting uh, the uh, my story, data story, and uh, what parts are adjusting to that exit, uh, and uh, that we're going to then focus on as well. And the, and the, 
um, data stories often start with, with, like it's a good pattern to start with all the data, filter out the parts that you're not gonna focus on because that orients everyone in your organization anyway who is familiar with that data to what part of it that you're going, going, going to be focusing on. Sorting. Um, so animation is very visceral for, for sorting, particularly with bar charts. And sorting itself is um, uh, 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 of bar charts can literally be used to show how particular measures correlate against each other. And notice that word correlate, that's a word from statistics. And so it, that's, that's a core, that can be a core part of a logic of a, a, of a data story that you're telling to each other. Now, you can also, sorting is also a great way to see ranking. Uh, and so in this particular story, I was focusing on ranking. I didn't, in that story, I didn't do it, but a very common pattern for data stories is to rank somewhere, uh, like either the top or bottom, and then go fo focus on uh, the, the highest or lowest rank things and then proceed f forward to try and figure out why th th those were ranked the way they are. Adding and removing measures. So uh, the, the reason why in a data story you might uh, uh, bring in an additional measure is uh, for comparison to, you, uh, to, uh, to a, a measure that you already have or to some effect you have, uh, or uh, also to explain that. Uh, uh, like, for example, explain why something is highly ranked. In this particular story, the still images here, um, I added and removed at the same time. That's essentially replace. And if you do that in a single step, you need to be super clear that you're actually doing the replacement. Animation can help with that, uh, but notice I also made it very, very clear uh, what, what, that the measures were changing as well. So you have, to, you have to do that as well. The cool part is um, you can also layer calculations in, essentially replace the existing measure uh, with a calculation based on top of that measure um, and, you, and this is very common in data stories for recoding, summarizing, uh, combining measures together. And uh, the, this particular example was moving from just the raw uh, re report counts to the uh, percent of total. Um, and that's, uh, the, moving to a percent of total is hard to explain to, to a general audience, but the animation honestly makes it much easier to, 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 to explain the, the logic of that step. So the final one uh, that I'm gonna talk about today is adding and removing uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, and when you do that, when you add or remove dimensions, what you're changing is level of detail. So that's what LOD means on this slide. It's, it's um, you're, you're changing the, the, the level of the dimensional uh, uh, encoding of, uh, of the data view. On the, on the left is an example of drilling in from my story. Uh, and, that, and, and you typically drill in to try and explain something. Uh, so the, in that particular one, there was this weird dip in May uh, to, uh, to June, and it turns out that uh, adding in the a dimensional breakdown by uh, elevation uh, uh, helped to explain that. You can also, the opposite, is to remove a dimension, um, and that's really, really useful for summarizing. So by removing the year on the right side, it helps to see that, no, this, this effect is still there even, even when that dimension's removed. Um, so here's the interesting point. I will tell you that these are the most common logical steps in data stories. And you know this is not scientific at this point, but I just illustrated all of them using animation. So you can use animation uh, for, for these logical steps. And as a person telling a data story, you may have other uses as well. Of course you might, but uh, it's, you should certainly investigate the possibility that animation can be used to tell those stories as well. Now I wanna talk about one more thing uh, we, uh, just like I demoed one more thing, which is that um, animation can also be used in creating little, little analytical applications for, 
for people to, to get their work done. And so there's, there's the picture of my little an analytical application. And why that, the, the most useful thing for animation there is um, uh, typically on dashboards, you can have your attention focused in one place, but uh, you want to be, have the person move their attention to a different place. And, that, and that's exactly what our, our visual systems evolved for, so the animation can uh, 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 help m get people move around uh, in, an, in a, in a multi-view application of one type or another. Yes, the labels also tell you where to go, uh, but the animation just uh, is a, a useful user experience technique for that. So now the core of this talk is the design principles, uh, uh, that, uh, which, I, which I would like to, to focus on. But be, before I start to go through principles, really, honestly, I want to say that the author knows best uh, there are a lot of different uh, data stories out, out there that, that you're telling for lots of different reasons. Uh, even though I'm going to give you a set of principles, uh, feel free not to follow my, my guidance um, uh, because you have particular needs and so, you, and so you, should, you should follow them. But please, please get feedback. Um, so Polly, in his talk earlier today, talked about, you know, when you cook, you know, you should, you know, a good cook will taste to make sure that the seasoning is right. Well, honestly, around um, animation and data stories, you need to not just use your visual system, system which will have uh, accommodated to the data story, but you really should ask your trusted friends who will give you the honest feedback whether, whether animation is, is wor working effectively uh, uh, for, for, for what you're trying to accomplish. So the first thing I'm going to say is that uh, when you're talking about logic in a data story, the wor words, more than anything else, explain the logic. And what the animation is for is to illustrate it. Uh, so a really good pattern is, is, to, is, to, is to explain the logic in words then show the animation and then explain it again if you really want to drive the, the logic home. Second principle, don't animate complexity. Uh, if you find yourself trying to, to come up with an animation for something complex, just don't do it. So in this particular step, in this story, I was moving from um, you know, a, a trend line to a binned histogram. And I, yeah, you could animate that. But it, it, it was just going to be extremely difficult to do that. And so instead, I just uh, jumped from one view to another. Um, I showed Hitchcock earlier because uh, in, uh, they, they would call, he, first of all, he, had, um, he was brilliant and he did a movie without having jumps. They call them cuts in movies. This is a cut. I call this a cut where you jump from one thing to another. It, tr it turns out most, most people besides Hitchcock make movies with cuts in them. Feel free to do that for your data stories as well. Now, get a little bit more academic here. There's a uh, very important paper by Tversky and Morrison that includes two design principles, which I'll, I'll get to in just a moment, but I, I need to describe the, the, the paper to you first. So the paper's titled, Animation, can it facilitate? And the basic, um, you, if, you, if you're familiar with academic papers, you'll know that uh, maybe not is, is, is the finding from that. So it's an actual, the actual work was uh, what, what we would call a meta-analysis. They studied lots and lots of, of papers about um, teaching of complex systems with computer graphics and animations and basically found um, that it, 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 on the averaged across all those papers, you, you wanted to be careful. But here's the key thing. Interactivity with, and with animation was, was effective. And, and so we shouldn't, we shouldn't be discouraged about the fundamental meta-analysis finding, but we should take the principles that they came up with from all of, all of that academic work, and we can use that very effectively for what we want to do it. So here are the two principles. I'll let you, I'll let you read the, 
the, the, the details of the words there, but the key, the key words are in, in the principles. Congruence and apprehension. And what congruence means is basically um, uh, you want to line things up. Um, and in particular, an, like for example, animation is really effective for changes and logic, logical steps are a form of change in the, in, the, in, in the logic of a story. And apprehension is really about you, the audience. Uh, it is the author's responsibility or the presenter's responsibility to make sure you can apprehend the changes. And so um, I'm going to say, tell you that you can actually combine those two together by using this example here of a uh, very nice, you can get, the link is at the bottom, um, uh, is a, is a, Bloomberg has a, had this really nice um, uh, little scrolly story uh, about, climate, about the climate crisis. Uh, and so what you have on the vertical axis is deviation from, uh, from, from average, and then on the horizontal axis is time. And so when you scroll into the story, at first you see an animation, um, Hello. There you go. So that's the animation running over time. And so I call that congruence. But then once the animation has fired, then you're just sitting here with the view that you can then look at and, and understand it. And then this, it uses this uh, pattern over and over again of as you scroll through, you see an animation of, of some measures. And then you can sit there and apprehend how they, how, they, how they combine together. So congruence and apprehension are very powerful concepts for telling effective data stories. Uh, you, want, you need to pay attention to both of them. The other thing that I've tried to illustrate here is that um, there are some stories that are designed to be standalone and other stories that are live. Uh, so for, uh, for a standalone story, it almost always has more text because um, uh, uh, you, you, there's no live presenter there to speak. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, this is one of the reasons why sc scrolly stories are very common, is you, you have this challenge as the author to get the, the, the audience member on a standalone story to trigger the animations. And scrolling happens to be really effective for that. And in this particular image here, you'll see that I had, um, I know the story went by really fast, but I, to, I had to have a bunch of red text in the left-hand corner to get people to click on, uh, on, the, on the filter widget so that they, they would then start stepping through the story. And live stories, you know, I, I can read the audience. I can tell whether you're falling asleep or whatnot and I need to speed up or whatnot. Uh, I can trigger the animations. I can redo an animation if people are looking puzzled. Uh, so, um, it, it, like, know what kind of uh, story you're telling. Uh, it will have an impact on, on, on your actual authoring of the story. Now, duration is super important. Uh, it, it's one of the key design issues. Too, too fast, and uh, the audience is going to just get confused. Too slow. Uh, you're, at the minimum, you're going to be a have a plotting story. Um, and um, here's the complex part with respect to design principles. It depends on the complexity of your content. And so let me dive into that some more, some more for you. Um, and I'm going to pull off a, a, from a, a, a really nice book um, by Jeff Johnson. Uh, it has a great title, too, Designing with the Mind in Mind. Um, and it, it, uh, in, the, in this book, the, the, you can see the page number here, he has a really nice section on human time constants. In other words, if you're going to tell stories, you're telling stories to humans, and so you have to have a, some understanding about humans. Uh, I've pulled out just four time constants here, but they're really useful for thinking about duration with respect, uh, with respect to data stories. Uh, 500 milliseconds, that's the top one. Uh, is basically where you're not going to get flicker. If you can, if you can go fa frames faster than that, you won't have flicker. Uh, a tenth of a second is standard co uh, 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 cause and effect perception. So that's very relevant for, for, for uh, 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 user interfaces in general and, and stories as well. 
Here's an interesting one. One second is uh, the average maximum silent gap in a conversation. In other words, if I'm having a conversation with you, we will get uncomfortable if there's more than about a second gap. And so, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting. And then there's a, a ten, 10 seconds is a unit task. Uh, and so that's where the complexity comes in. And so um, the stories that I showed you are all, all ran about two seconds. The Hans Rosling clip I showed you was 45 seconds, but he had four tasks that he wanted to do during that period of time. Talk about China, talk about Bangladesh, talk about HIV, and then his punchline, it, it, the, the uh, completely new world. That's four things, and interestingly enough, that's times 10 is slightly more than, than 40 seconds. So he's off to the right, um, but that's, so as you think about durations, you should think about, um, uh, about what you're trying to accomplish. Now, you can also use animation, I'm, this talk is about um, animation for, for telling stories, but you can also use animation during the flow of analysis, which is going to be the default uh, for, 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 for us. But for analysis, where you're trying to focus on uh, you know, coming up with an answer or, sol or solving a question, you need to, the duration needs to be faster. It needs to start, the animation should start before a tenth of a second because that way you can perceive the cause and effect of whatever you did. And it really should finish in, in less than a second uh, just to fit in, just so that you can end up ha uh, ha be, ha be having a conversation with your computer as you're trying to, to, to answer your question. And I'm going to read this quote. This is a really nice quote uh, that actually applies to all of user experience design. Systems have about a second to either do what the user asked or indicate how long it will take. And so, yeah, so for, for, for analysis flow, animation should, should be just uh, tuck, tucked in there in less than a second. Now, one more thing I want to talk about um, is that for data stories, there are, uh, for logical steps in data stories, there are uh, four really common phases that you see. Um, um, uh, Polly earlier today, he, he, he was talked about Julius Caesar, which is, so, it was, it was really cute. I thought that was great. So the, that the marks can exit. Uh, there can be movement of marks against one axis. There can also be movement or sorting against a different axis, and finally marks can enter. So you can actually illustrate, you can use animation to illustrate all, all four of these sequentially, and there is a choice um, in, the, in the alpha, you, can, you will find a choice to be able to do this. So here, here's an animation. Marks exiting, uh, movement, a sorting, and then uh, mar marks entering. So, so that, so, and, then, and, then, and then, then you can see it going, going in the other direction as well. So that's, that, that's illustrating all four phases. Um, if I go to the next slide... You can see them. Do, you can see the impact of for that same view of doing them all simultaneously, overlapping with each other. So the so these are both choices for you. The question is, uh, which should you use? It, well, honestly, author knows best. So you decide which one, which which choice you want to use. But just to give you a little academic uh, input to your to your to your decision, here's another paper. Um, again, you can tell by the title, not so staggering effect of staggered anima animated transitions. So the, this particular uh, group of authors studied a bunch of people um, and they found some problems with staggering. Staggering would be not doing it all at the same time. Um, the, there is a definite temptation to stagger um, because you're just trying to, you think you're trying to make it simpler the, the actual temptation, though, the real temptation is that you, you decide that you're trying to teach in a single animation. If you, if you find yourself doing that, then you, then you should think about breaking it apart into mo multiple logical steps uh, and then take the person through each of those. And that's effective teaching because you'll have wrapped each logical step in words, and it's the words that actually teach. 
Um, but what they found was, um, first of all, if you, if you stagger, you end up with longer durations, which can make, your, make a plotting story. Um, it can get really confusing, uh, and it can make it harder for the audience to understand what, what's going on. So this is an animated GIF that I found on the internet. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I wanted to uh, thank you all for your attention. Um, I want to leave you with one final important thought, and I'm going to let animation do that. And at this point, I always say Spider-Man, because, of course, this is the... This is, this is the, uh, the slogan that's, that's connected with Spider-Man. And the power is animation. Your visual system is extremely sensitive to animation. And so then you, as an author, uh, uh, going off and telling data stories to others, uh, you have great responsibility. So go out and do good with, in the world. Um, I'm going to have to, uh, I, uh, there we, we have like 10 minutes for questions. I love to answer questions live. 